Cool, welcome back to the Open Programming Miniconf. Hope you had a good lunch break. Um, before we get started with talks, uh, lightning talks, sign up on the wiki. Uh, we want to see heaps of lightning talks af uh, at the end of the day so that we don't finish early. Um, I didn't schedule talks then so that people could do lightning talks and people aren't signing up for them now, so you better get and sign up for lightning talks. Um, <laughs> well, go on, register yourself. Uh, so, our first presenter after lunch is Malcolm Locke, who is a resident of Christchurch. Uh, last year he put in his biography something about earthquakes. Um, he didn't put it in there this year. Um, so he's going to give us a talk about the JavaScript testing toolbox. Please make him welcome. Thanks everyone. Um, yep, as Chris just said, um, my name is Malcolm Block. I'm a consultant and web developer and sometimes sysadmin from Christchurch. Um, I'm, those who know me know I'm a bit fanatic about TDD and testing. And um, the first point I want to make is what the heck is this guy doing at LinuxConf talking about JavaScript? We only talk about real programming languages at this conference. Um, the um, the thing about JavaScript, it's not necessarily for most people anything that we, we um, <laughs> set out at the beginning of our career to learn as our primary language. It's almost anybody, can anybody who has ever written any JavaScript put their hands up in the room? I think that's everybody, basically. Maybe one or two exceptions. Um, it's something that basically if you ever do anything on the web, you're going to have to write at least one or two lines of JavaScript. Um, that JavaScript code is rarely ever tested. Um, for the reason I said earlier, it's not generally your primary language. It's not something that you tend to take too seriously when you first start doing it. And But the demands of your JavaScript code will quite often escalate. Most people's JavaScript uh, certainly mine up until recently is not very well factored. You tend to write huge pages of jQuery nonsense just you know on an ad hoc basis. And it's very difficult to approach because this is all browser based code, you don't you, it's hard to approach with the same mentality that you'd approach uh, um, Python or Perl or Ruby code um, testing. Uh, it is really important though if you're doing more than a tiny bit of JS to actually try and test what you're writing. Um, you've got a colossal variety of platforms and implementations that you're targeting when you write JavaScript code for the web. Probably the most widely installed interpreted language in the world. Wherever there's a browser, pretty much, there's going to be a JavaScript interpreter there. So that's a lot of installations. Um, it's really helpful to have a JavaScript test suite to aid you in debugging problems. If you've got good coverage for your JavaScript code, um, you can usually just, and somebody's having a problem with their particular combination of versions of software that they're using, you can just point them to the, to the test suite and say, tell me what this shows. And usually it will give you a better indication of the error than just the apps not working for them. Um, and the JavaScript code is getting more and more complex every day that we write. Um, it's really become the de facto language for sort of client side implementations for web pages. Um, you know, there was a time back in ancient web history where Java applets were supposed to be the thing for client interaction. That never really took off, and JavaScript has taken over that role. And also, there's the emergence of um, things like Node.js, where people are writing JavaScript server side, and um, obviously, you're going to want test coverage for that. Uh, I'm just going to demonstrate a few tools and use the simplest um, bit of code I can to demonstrate how you, would, how you test using a few tools that are out there. It's my, by no means the complete list of tools, it's just a select few. Um, so this is the piece of code I'm going to do, just to add two numbers together function. Um, uh, the first tool I'm going to talk about is QUnit. Um, it's written by the jQuery team and it's actually used by jQuery's um, test suite itself. Um, because of that it actually requires jQuery to run so it's not necessarily the best choice if you're not using jQuery. Um, 
It doesn't have spies, mocks or stubs, which we'll, I'll talk about later. And, but it has got some good tools if, you're, if the code you're wanting to test is really just about DOM manipulation and adding and removing elements from the page. Um, to get started using it, you have, to, you have to run this code in the browser. So basically to rerun the test suite, you open it in the browser and you hit reload. And that's how it works. Um, and you need a little piece of HTML scaffold to actually run the code. That's basically the bare minimum there, um, including the QUnit JavaScript, um, including the adder.js, which is the code I'm wanting to test, and the actual test suite that I want to run. And that's what the basics of a typical test are going to look like. We've got a module block there which does any setup and teardown you want to do before each test, test runs. Um, this is going to be familiar if you've done unit testing in any, any other languages. Um, I've got a, a test there that's a good one. It expects um, the answer of adding two and two to equal four. Only, I'm saying expect one test. So if only more or less than one test has run after that block of code, then something's gone wrong. And then I've just put a broken test in there so that we can see um, this is saying checking that two plus two equals six. Um, so that, I don't know how readable that is for you guys, probably not very good. What is that? So that's the output of that scaffold web page after you run the tests. Um, normally you'll just see a big load of blue lines saying everything's fine and it all worked. If you get any failures, you get um, a nice little description of what went wrong. Um, quite handy for debugging. There's also a couple of options up the top there. No globals, which will um, notify you if you leak any global variables into the global namespace, which is quite easy to do in JavaScript. And no try catch, which basically normally the tests run and rot, wrap the whole suite in a try catch block. That will stop it doing that, which can help you debugging the tests again. Um, you get all of these assertions available, so um, you know for just checking various um, expectations on your code. Um, the tools for testing DOM manipulation are quite handy um, in QUnit. You can basically create an element on that scaffold page with an ID of QUnit fixture, put the markup you want in there to test, and that markup element will be reset to the pristine state in the page um, that it was in the static page every time each test runs, which is quite useful if you're adding 500 elements. It'll just get um, reset back to the beginning again. Here I've got an example how you'd, how you'd implement that. I've just got an empty UL in there. I've got a bit of code that adds a list item into a, into a list. And then I can test that just like that. And by just using normal jQuery functions to check the, um, the length of the list after I've called the, the test should be one. And then this second test at the bottom is just proof that the, the element will be reset on the next test run, um, and that's uh, and that's actually running as an iframe in the browser, so that's not a screenshot. It's actually running the test. Um, then that, that's basically it's quite a good if you're using jQuery and you want a basic X unit style framework, Q unit's a good choice. Um, if you're not using jQuery, you might have to research around a little bit for other ones. I'm, I can't really recommend a different one. Jasmine is a, um, uh, it's a BDD style, so it's generally supposed to make the test slightly more humanly readable than, um, than an XUnit style. Um, it has spies, stubs, and mocks, which I'll show you in a, in a little while. Um, and it's not um, dependent on any other libraries like jQuery, so it's completely standalone. Um, needs an HTML scaffold, runs in the browser, same as QUnit, not really worth showing here, it's just an empty HTML document. Um, that's what the same test would look like. Um, and you can just see that the order of the tests make it slightly more, expect this to equal four. It's more like um, human speech basically and, and it generally easier to read. Um, that's what the test runner looks like. Normally you'll just see a little tiny green element at the top where it says two specs, one failure. That will be green and that's all it will show you. It won't show you a huge ream of all of the tests. It will just say how many tests run, 
how many failures there were. Normally that will be green, but obviously we've got that intentionally failing test in there to show you the output. Um, you get these matches. There's just a few of them and there's a lot more available. Test whether something is truthy, falsy, whether it matches a regex, whether it can, an array contains a value. Um, you can also add your own matches, which becomes quite useful when you've got stuff within the domain of your application that you want to test. Um, so here, are any number over 1,000 I consider to be a big number, and I want to just write an assertion that that number's big. Um, you can use it like all of the other matches once you've implemented that. Um, spies, uh, these are basically, um, can behave like mock objects um, that you can check whether they were, a function was called or not during the duration of the test. Um, allows you to, quite often your code becomes intertwined and without loading your entire environment up, you generally only want to test one class or function. So it allows you to create fake objects to use um, in those tests so that you're only testing the, the system under test, the SUT. Um, and there's an example of how you've got a blog post and a comment and the comments are linked to blog posts and you're quite often going to have code like this in your comment prototype that calls this dot post dot get title. You don't want to have to load all of the other code up to do that if you're testing it properly. You just want to be testing this one, um, this comment class rather than the post class. Um, this is basically um, how you create a spy in Jasmine. So it just creates an anonymous um, method um, and you can just very succinctly describe how you want that method to behave. So, and um, I'm going to spy on the get title method on this object that I've, and if it gets called, I'm going to return that dummy title string. Um, you can also use it to ensure that a particular piece of a particular method on an object was called during the duration. So I've got a window.logger at the top there, which in my real application is going to be a big complex prototype object, but I don't want to have to use that in a real test. So um, I just create this spy object. And at the end of the test, after I've called post the comment, I just want to make sure that the logger object had the log method called with that argument. Um, as I said earlier, no dependencies for Jasmine, which is quite good. You can nest the describe blocks, which is a really useful thing. You'll quite often end up in the, um, in the setup block doing a lot of work, um, building up fake objects. And sometimes you just want them all to be the same except for two tests where, the, where the, one of the setup items is different and the nesting the blocks allows you to do that. Uh, it's a very useful feature in, in practice. Uh, next tool. Um, tool called Synon. It's not a um, testing framework per se, but it um, just gives you a load of tools. So you can use it with QUnit, you can use it with Jasmine. It gives you some very powerful spy and stub behaviors, and it gives you this really cool fake Ajax server. Um, that is tremendously useful, and I'll probably actually, because my time's running out, um, I'll skip through most of this to just talk about that. Um, if you've got an app that does Ajax calls, you don't even have to have the server code written to actually start doing the JavaScript with this. You can define, basically, whenever that uh, get request is made to that URL, return status 200 with application JSON and chuck this um, JSON back to the JavaScript code. So. Any Ajax calls that get made in the app get intercepted by this object. And um, another really useful thing is that the, the fake Ajax server doesn't respond to the request until you actually explicitly tell it to. So say you've got the classic example, user clicks on a button, an Ajax calls made, and a spinner class needs to be added to the button to show that it's loading. You can simulate a button press, check the spinner class, OK, yes, it's present. Now respond and check the rest of the um, behavior there. So that's really a really useful tool. Um, I do use it quite a lot, and I recommend, if you do Ajax work, 
having a look at that. Um, other things, um, there's some good integrations with QUnit and Jasmine available just to make succinct usage possible. And the fake timers, which is quite useful if you want to test something like um, transitions over a certain number of milliseconds, you can actually just immediately fast forward the system clock 5,000 milliseconds or whatever and then check some element has been removed from the page, quite useful. Um, I was going to talk about a couple of other tools, but I just wanted to show this one instead. Um, I was going to talk about Selenium and JS Test Driver. This is a very recent tool and it's really promising looking. Um, it's from the same author as Synon and uh, another guy. Um, it is very fresh. It is, I've been trying it as I've prepared this talk and it actually works quite well. Um, it requires Node.js and it combines a lot of features of QUnit and Jasmine into one tool plus some very cool extra things. It doesn't require the HTML scaffold, it generates that itself, so you just have a config file telling it about your source files and your test files and where to find them. Um, it can do the, the QUnit style assertions or it can do the Jasmine style assertions with the same tool, so you can take whatever your preferred method. You can test Node.js code with it completely headlessly. So if you've got a Node.js project, just set the testing up and run Buster test inside the Node.js and it will run from the command line in the normal unit test style. Um, you can generate static pages like the scaffold page. Um, just set up a local server um, and you can point a web browser to those and load it just like did with the um, Jasmine or QUnit. You can export those files to the file system as well if you want to put them on a server somewhere and say to somebody, hey, can you just try and run this test for me? Um, the coolest feature is the Buster server. Um, this sets up a, a server on localhost, listening on port 1111. Um, you can then point lots of browsers at that server and you get a page which says capture this browser. You press the button and the Buster server will take control of that, that browser at that point, that browser window. So you can have Chrome, Chromium, Firefox, Opera, your iPhone, your Android phone, all pointing at one instance. And then whenever you run Buster test within your project, it will remote control all of those browsers, run the test suite on them, and return the results back to your console window. Really, really cool feature. Um, JS test driver does do that at the moment. Not quite as cleanly as Buster and it's a big Java app that requires a particular setup for it. So um, definitely um, a really promising tool to keep an eye on. And we've just squeezed it all in. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. For you. Given that we're running a bit late, we've still got plenty of time for questions. Is this uh, making sound? Yeah, cool. Uh, so anyone got questions for Malcolm about JavaScript testing? Cool. <laughs> um, it's not so much about testing as about debugging, but um, you might know in Node.js there's a convention to make any error the first argument to a callback, so you can ex inspect the stack more easily. Okay, so, I didn't know that uh, okay. in Node.js because I haven't done oh, well, any much work with If it. you don't know about that, it's probably not relevant. I was just wondering whether you'd tried that on the client side at all. No, right. no, sorry. <laughs> Hey, anyone else? Um, so I've I've actually done this recently at work, like last week. I got Selenium running with QUnit and Synon JS. Um, I didn't use Jasmine. Have you tried the mocking and stubbing in Synon as well? Could, could you do you have an idea of the comparison? The, um, the so um, yeah, Jasmine has got spies and stubs and mocks built into it. They're not as powerful as the Synon ones. So the Synon ones, you can control the behavior of the stubs. For example, if it gets called with an argument, then do this. If it calls with another argument, then do something else. Um, that's really useful. And you can also say, you know, the first time this method gets called, do this. The second time it gets called, do something else. That's, it's just a lot more powerful than the, um, than the Jasmine built-in mechanism. Anyone else? Okay, if nobody's got any more questions, please thank Malcolm for his talk. Thank you. Okay, we'll just take a moment or two to swap our presenters over.
Is that good? That sounds pretty good to me. Awesome.